Five Caches. How you hey, doing? Man. Doing phenomenal, okay. Dennis. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate this, man. My my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, let me see. Where the right base? Where are you? Okay. Here we go. How you doing? Doing good, man. What type of base is that, by the way? Uh, it's a custom-made Spectre with 24 frets. I mean, it's like a one-of-a-kind Spectre base. Wow. Spectre. And it's got 24 frets. And this is, it was built when Stewart owned the company before Cord bought it. So he was very kind to make this for me. And uh, yeah, you know, I've been favoring playing uh, Codas, which is this model, the Coda. Yeah. It's kind of like a, you know, resembles the uh, the Fender shape, you know. And since I grew up playing Fenders, I've been, uh, you know, that's the shape that I'm comfortable with on stage, you know, even though I do play... I played in the past the the actual Spectre, what is known for that style, the NS that stands for Ned Steinberg. Okay. Uh, and he's the one who actually designed that shape of for what is known as this classic Spectre base. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, th base. through your career. Since you, you asked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right now we got the answer for all the base heads out there. I mean, do you typically like to stay to the same sort of setup? Because I know you guys are touring with Quiet Riot right now. Or does that change a lot? Tour? It's the same because I, I travel with, I, I like to keep it simple. You know, we don't even, we don't even have a crew uh, because it doesn't make sense to take a crew with us. I mean, which is there, the back line is supplied by, uh, by the promoter. Uh, they and then a lot of a lot of times when we play with other acts, let's say you have uh, you have Great White Slaughter, you have Quiet Riot, Vixen on you know, the same bill. We'll share the same backline except for the drums. The drums get rolled in and out the stage. You know, they're on risers with wheels. Okay, so that's the only thing that changes. Everything that the backline stays the same. And some bands even have Kem Kemplers, okay. you know, those uh, the guitar simulators. So they just use the right. cabs so they can hear themselves. But the sound is coming out of the Kempler rather than from the amplifier. Uh, I use On the Road, which is a whole different setup than when I record. When I record, it's a little bit more elaborate. But On the Road, I use the Tech 21 D... P, which stands for Doug Pinnock X3 or 3X. The the three is the three buttons. It's got three buttons on okay. the pedal. And I use that basically as my preamp and it goes into the power in of, of the SVTs that are supplied. Yes, I, I, I request. It's a must that I have an SVT amplifier on stage. Yeah. But so I'm just using the... Uh, the uh the the power amp stage of the amplifier and the speakers and it's you know i have to tweak it a little bit just a tweak and those pedals are very sensitive and but they're amazing so and then i feed the house the di comes out of my pedal so the same tone okay. that i get on stage through the amplifier is goes out to the house now whatever Whatever the uh, the front of the house guy does with the mix, that's I have no control. It's another about story, that. but at least, <laughs> yeah, but at least I'm feeding him a an authentic tone that I that I have on stage. It's a whole process, and I mean, this is the process you guys are obviously working on now. You know, Rudy, when I say Quiet Riot Tour 2023, mm. what's the first reaction for you? Is that a surprise to you, or is that something that you said, well, yeah, <clears throat> I, mean, I always well, saw this coming. Well, it's uh, I started touring with the band last year, and we and I was always looking forward to this year because this year being the 40th anniversary of Metal Hell. So there's more, I don't know, trying to find to find the right word without being nostalgic, but there's more more to celebrate, I guess. Going on stage, feeling like you know we made it this far, or the consciousness of the band made it this far. See, you know, there's there's different reasons why musicians, or even myself, I used to get up on stage. 
I used to get up on stage first because when I was a kid, I wanted to attract girls. <laughs> right. That's why a lot <laughs> I of was guys a start. Little kid. Yeah, that's how you start. You know, I mean, you don't spend a whole lot of time in your bedroom for nothing. Just <laughs> practicing. You want to be like really, really cool. And then you practice in front of the mirror and then you're on stage trying to attract the girls. You know, and with time, you become a musician. You know, you find the, the real purpose of music, you know, and uh, I can get re I can go down the rabbit hole, but uh, but I'm going to keep it more superficial, you know. We like the rabbit hole too, though, every once in a while. <laughs> eh, maybe later on in the conversation. <laughs> maybe later we'll on. The rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. But right now, we're just eating a little, a little bit of grass. Oh, that's no. right we're just getting started then we're going to hole <laughs> yeah uh so you know right now the way i look at what we do first of all it's it's co totally completely you know it's a celebration of the legacy of the band quiet riot and the memory and celebrating the memory of frankie benali and kevin dubro and andy rose yeah and that's at the core of everything you know, and but also if you, I, I like to look at it from other perspectives, perception of what we do, not just ourselves, but every every other band of our genre, like let's say Slaughter and Warren, Great White, Winger, uh, Vixen, you know, all the bands that came out in the 80s, we're also celebrating the consciousness that comes along with that because we music we are the the soundtrack of that consciousness of that collective consciousness that brings everybody together to our shows so that's why there's so much camaraderie when we go uh, when we play all these multiple bills because it's about the consciousness not only of the band but also of all of us you know the public the audience yeah. that watch our videos on MTV, bought our records, wore our shirts, and believe in the music, and we became the soundtrack of that of that '80s generation. All of us, hundred percent. I mean, do do you feel like that's really making a big comeback today? Because you know, personally, I've noticed '90s and '80s seems to be <clears throat> you know the nostalgia is just going crazy right now. Yeah, and then again, I don't call it nostalgia. I call it connecting with the collective consciousness, which right. is what brings us together, all of us. I mean, and it's not just us, it's every single band. Uh, and each band represents a collective consciousness. Uh, that's why every band that succeeds. Yeah, good. 100%. The more the, more the, co the consciousness spreads to a, to a mass, then more of a mass audience, the more success you have and it's because they it resonates with more people you know but it's it's basically you know let's say a band that is completely different let's say you two mm -hmm. you two there is a collective consciousness and there's a few people that agree with me on this that actually you two is the biggest christian band in the world Really? And when I say Christian, yeah, oh yeah, oh, uh, I've, I've ever, I've ever watched a uh, a show, a U two show. At the end of the show, there's a song, I forget the name. It's a psalm from the Bible that hmm. they they play, they perform, and and at the end of the night, Bono hangs a rosary on his microphone. There, really? There's plenty wow. of videos of that song. Uh, of him, you know, this is the their encore, the the last song that they 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 perform. But they, it's not that they hide it. It's just that if you if you get it, you get it, and if you don't, they're not, you know, they're not gonna try to like pummel you with exactly. like you know their religious beliefs. No, it's like if you if you get it, great. If you don't, maybe someday or maybe never. But the most important thing is the is the act of collective spirituality mm -hmm. because you could be from different religions but still believe in the fundamentals what that bring all spirituality together yeah and you're resonating we're all in the same frequency and that's the most important thing 
you know, to just to break down the barriers of specific uh, religions and just break it down to what I call the quantum field. I like that. <laughs> and that's really something that, <laughs> now we're going deep. You did mention the anniversary of mental health, which, you know, obviously a mm-hmm. massive milestone for Quiet Riot. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, looking back on that time, what was that? sort of period in the group like because i mean that was a huge huge point for the band yeah um that's a really good question which uh i always have to start at the beginning my beginning with quiet riot goes back to 1978 uh when i joined the randy rhodes version of the band and randy was the only musician i've ever been a band with that comes from a musical family completely mm. mom and dad music professors that built they built a music school which is still out there called musonia it's in north hollywood so he came from academia he he could play you know classical music read music he learned composition music theory even before he was in a rock band so wow. at the core of his being, Randy Rose was a musician and actually a teacher. Before he became famous with Ozzy, he, he, that, he, he spent more time teaching music than actually playing in a band. That's when I joined in 78. So there was so much musical integrity that I was exposed to with Randy in Choir Riot. And then Randy left Choir Riot. Choir Riot ceased to exist as a band. And then Kevin put his own band called Dubro. I just I I played in Dubro, but also I was involved in other projects, other bands. I moved in with Kevin and then I joined Ozzy. And then by that time, Randy already had recorded uh Speak of the um uh Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. And I joined when in 1981, when they were looking for a bass player for the American tour of of uh, Speak of the Devil, this is 1981, and now Randy is at a whole different level, yeah, because he's got the musical freedom to practice his musical integrity, go back to being the classical guitar player that he's uh, was always, but was never able to show that as a member of Choir Riot because. You know, Choir Riot was more designed to be a, um, a kind of like a glam rock band. And there, was, there wasn't really much room for classical. And also, we just we were not equipped. Back in the day, to mic an acoustic guitar properly, we just didn't have the equipment to do that, especially right. for a local band. And so when it came time for Randy to go into the studio to record with Ozzy, he could do that. He could play classical pieces. If he played classical guitar on a record, he could actually use the Les Paul. And we had our sound guy using a harmonizer to emulate the, the classical guitar tone by turning down the distort, you know, mm-hmm. the the volume and yeah. making it more to sound acoustically. So he could play like that. Um, Randy's Randy designed his uh, Jackson to have a neck that simulated the the width of the classical guitar because wow. that's what he was used to. That's why he really enjoyed playing the Gibson Les Paul because it was a wider neck like a Spanish guitar, you know, classical. So um, I learned so much and I was exposed to so much musical integrity Randy and everybody in the Aussie camp, you know, because, you know, now now I'm with the pros here, you know. And then when Randy passed away, I lost the joy of making music. So I get a phone call from Kevin Dubrow to come in and record one of the songs I used to play with him in Dubrow, which was uh, Thunderbird. He wrote that song when Randy left Quiet Riot in 79 to join Ozzy, and then he change a little bit of the lyrics and the third verse to fit the uh, tribute to Randy that which is just what that song is all about and uh, if you look at the back of the cover of Metal Hell you're going to see that it's, the album is dedicated to the memory of Randy wrote so it was all in the spirit of recording a tribute mm-hmm. to our 
dear friend and 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 mentor to all of us, Randy Rhodes. He was such an example. I mean, he's at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame all by himself, not, not even with Ozzy or Choir Riot. It's Randy Rhodes. That's unreal. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. So I mean, that's that much of an impact he, he had. See, he had. I'm talking to you about somebody who was there with him. Yeah. And I could talk to somebody like, let's say, Tom Morello, who was very responsible for uh, for Randy being in the Hall of Fame, and Tom felt the same impact and he he had never even met randy rose but it's the music it's the frequencies of the music you can you can know so much about an individual by listening if they're truly an artist by listening to their music their compositions yeah. you know because a great composer it's it's an open book that's Even it, especially when you're tapped into might, that consciousness as well, right? You can feed off oh, of that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about, let's say, somebody like Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, who would write lyrics about all these other different characters. Right. Whereas Randy, he didn't write the lyrics. He wrote the music. So these were emotions that he had inside of him that he would play those emotions, you know. Which is a little bit different than somebody who is a singer songwriter who is actually trying to capture other people's consciousness and mm. write stories about them. You know, right. uh, John Lennon was very, very uh, successful doing that. He could pick up the newspaper and write a song like "A Day in the Life" based on based on news items. In he the, was like in a reporter in a, in a sense. Yeah, CNN. You know? Yeah, well, that's what that's the way I look at rap music, especially you right. know, early rap. It was reporting what was going on in 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 the uh, in the neighborhood. Exactly, a hundred percent. And then other people, they mm -hmm. they sort of had that just coming from within them. So, so you're saying that's sort of how Randy was. Which, I mean, that's the way I've always heard him described. Um, you know, mm -hmm. how would you how would you describe the relationship with him and Ozzy? Because obviously, you were very close, and he's been described as almost like a son type of figure to Ozzy. Yeah, son, brother. Yeah, it was. Ozzy was really in awe of his musicianship and and his uh, commitment. You know, you know, Randy was well, authentic. There was nothing really derivative about Randy. He wasn't trying to be anybody else but himself. And he consciously stayed away from other people's techniques mm -hmm. just because he didn't want to be associated with them. Wow. So he, he really know, he, wanted to keep so that about his musicianship. Because he, he wanted to stay pure to himself. Yeah. You know, so if if, if there was a technique, let's say somebody like uh, Eddie Van Halen mm -hmm. was popular for playing, he would stay away from it. Did he yeah. ever mention that about maybe Eddie or anybody else? Or was that just something that you noticed? It, it's something I noticed. It was never a an issue bringing it up. It was something that I hmm. He's 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 writing his his own story. He's not borrowing or stealing from anybody else's. He's just remaining authentic and pure to himself. Do you think that he admired other players? Were were there any players? That, oh yeah, that he spoke of course, on? of course he did. Of course he did. Of course he did. Uh, I can tell you the people that we used to listen when we, we used to get off the stage and go and chill in the uh, in the back of the bus. Uh, uh, Lee Rittenauer, one of them. Hmm. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I bumped into Lee at, 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 on a flight that I told him about Randy because I, that, that's, that's one of my best memories, popping his... Uh, his cassette, Lee Rittenauer's cassette, and sitting there with Randy listening to to that record, you know, it was great. Yeah, Lee Rittenauer, Leslie West, you know, he admired people for for different reasons. They could be tone, they could be uh, choice of notes. Uh, Bill Nelson from Bebop Deluxe was another one. Uh, the the guitar players in Alice Cooper. You know, there, there, there were so many, but he was Johnny Winters, you know, all mm -hmm. of those, all, you know, all the big 70s guitar players. 
That's incredible. You know, looking back on the tours with Ozzy, we always hear about the debauchery and all the wild man behavior of Ozzy, especially off stage. If somebody was to be there, you know, I've hmm. always wondered, was it more wild than a person would expect or less wild than a person might actually expect? While I was there, uh, Okay, and when I was there, this is, I was with Ozzy, let's say Randy passed away in March 19th. I left the band uh, by the time we recorded Speak of the Devil in September. And we we basically had a run from March 19th to the end of June, early July, we went into Japan. So you know, March April, May, June, July. So we had like four months of touring left. And, you know, Ozzy got to a point that he was really hurting, hurting emotionally. So Sharon gave him a little bit more rope so he could, you know, drink a little bit more just to keep him, uh, you know, let, allowing him to, I don't know, kill the pain with it. But then I, after I left, after I left, that's when you hear all the crazy stories of, of touring with Motley Crue and snorting the ants and, and all the stuff and, you know, things that, you know, stories that, you know, you can, if you watch the movie, The Dirt, it's in The Dirt, it's in the book, all the bands talk about it. You know, but I wasn't there for that. So I cannot really, you know, as a witness, I cannot give you that. Uh, he was controllable. But I mean, controllable, Sharon made sure that there was not a whole lot of booze, if any, on the tour bus. He was basically doing an, an intervention every single day. And then after Randy died, it was kind of like, okay, you know. Go for it. But she always kept an eye on him, making sure he would not go off the deep end, you know. How would you describe having her sort of at the head of the tour and sort of how she she runs things? I thought up until she became a celebrity, it was the best kept secret in, in all of the music industry. She was phenomenal. The best. I learned so much from her. Uh she was miraculous. <laughs> the things yeah. that she could get done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, she, she should write a book on how to do it because she knows how to do it and do it just the best way that it can ever be done. Yeah. But things sort of changed over the years. And, and I could imagine because their lives changed also. It wasn't necessarily just the touring and everything that was multifaceted from there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was at the very beginning when things were really started to explode uh, with merchandise. Um, the production, I mean, we had a huge stage production with us when we went out with the castle. Yeah. You know, we had a, uh, we had a, a cast. We had a, a, a little person running around the <laughs> stage dressed like a monk. Amazing. Uh, yeah, we had pyro, we had lasers. I mean, you know, they just kept adding on stuff to make the show more phenomenal, you know. And uh, and also merchandising. There were a lot, a lot of bootleggers mm. uh, following the band, and she knew how, she knew how to take care of that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. You know, speaking on your experience mm -hmm. also with Dio, um, I'm just curious if you mm -hmm. could maybe speak a little bit about that. Obviously, a guy who many people, there's a lot of lore, and I think they wonder sort of what it was like to be sort of around him and his mm -hmm. camp. Okay, with Ronnie, I started playing with Ronnie. I was like 25 years into my career. I'm 40 now, 40 years into it now. 41, 42, yeah. Since 81, yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I have seen and learned everything that there is to in the music industry. And then Ronnie just taught me a whole different, took me to a higher level. I had three major mentors. Uh, and by mentors, I mean like you're in a place in your, in your journey. And you kind of like, you feel like you're a standstill, but you know that there's a door to go through to the next level. 
Right. But you can't find the door. Yeah. You know, and then there's people that will show you the door. Some mm -hmm. of them, uh, they do it by example. Most of the time, the best time. And I would say Frankie Benelli in 19, when I started playing with him in 1972, he had already been at a level which I aspired to. So he was like my first mentor, you know, teaching me about how to be part of the rhythm section, you know, how to play with the drummer, how to play rock. Because I was playing ma mainly Latinized rock and roll. Okay. So that's what that's that's the, the um, that's why I grew up and playing with Latin musicians. Cuban roots, also right? Same. Cuban roots, yeah. Nice. In the uh, and these were newly arrived Cubans. Okay. Fresh, fresh off the boat. <laughs> yeah, with, with all the culture, you know. So probably playing Cuban music and you name it, right? Well, I was I I grew up listening to Cuban music, but not playing because I was very young and I didn't have okay. an instrument. Um, it wasn't until, but then once you start playing rock and roll for the Cuban community, they want to, they want to dance. Right. So you start incorporating percussion because that's, it will guarantee that people will dance to that. And, um, so when I started playing with Frankie, he taught me how to do, how to play rock and roll, but the British invasion version mm -hmm. of it, which is basically rooted in little richard right early early roots of rock and roll little richard chuck berry that's a uh, jerry lee lewis and and some elvis you know but but i say some because elvis was not really known for playing an instrument and i'm talking about the instrumental feel of playing you know playing the bass which right. is basically the extension of little richard's left hand playing the bass on the piano Right, you know, that's true. By, by then, yeah, and then, then by then I had uh, James Jimerson and Paul McCartney. I mean, McCartney was not the original bass player in the Beatles. He it was Stu Sutcliffe, and then Stu left the band, and and nobody wanted to play bass. So, and, and McCartney was playing keyboards. Okay. And one thing that's interesting, being left-handed, when you play keyboards, see, there's not a left-handed piano. Right. <laughs> it's one piano. If you have to be left-handed, you like, well, it's, it's the same thing. It's one piano, right? So he developed being a lot of strength on his left hand and mm. a, lot of, a lot of like rhythm, dun, 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 right? So so when we replace the bass left, his pick hand oh. is actually the hand that plays dun, 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 dun. Right. So we can just switch right? it. So he developed yeah. that. He developed that feel. And the right wow. and and the fretting hand was the right hand. So, a a left-handed musician that plays a string instrument that comes from piano has that advantage. You're wow. using this hand to be melodic, which is the same thing as your right hand on the piano, and your left hand to pluck. So it all sort of transfers just depending on which way you want to play. Well, if your left hand playing the piano. Your your right uh, your right hand is still going to be melodic, and your right. left hand is going to be the bass. Going to keep the bass, and then when then once you put the, the bass or the guitar in your hand, it does the same thing. Your right yeah. hand is going to be the melodic, moving up and down frets, and your left hand is going to pl pluck and create the rhythm. This that's is the amazing. rhythm, the left hand. Yeah, so it that's one of the things that I think really help McCartney to be so melodic and so rhythmic to be able to take all of those elements that he already knew from playing rock and roll on the piano, rock and roll piano. Yeah. And to be you able know. to sort of transfer. And also, yeah, exactly. That's what he did. That's the best word, transfer. He transferred that knowledge into the bass and into the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the perception of playing the instrument within the Beatles. He changed everything. Him and James Jimerson. No they, question. They changed the whole outlook. Yeah. Carol Kay was another one. I yeah. mean, they, they, there were a few, but these are, you know, the ones who were like on, on the biggest selling records, you know, like, like I mentioned, James Jimerson, Paul McCartney and Carol Kay. That, that would be like the trio right there. So you found a whole host of new sort of techniques. Then once you started up with Dio. 
Techniques are always actually basically the same technique. I mean, I I grew up playing top forty, and and I've and I've and I've, I've had conversations with with younger musicians, you know, who and I say younger because, you know, when I came up in the music industry, we learned by playing top forty, which means we top forty ran the gamut uh, from Johnny Cash to Led Zeppelin. Yeah, and every, and you know everything in between that, right? And so you would listen and play country music, heavy metal, blues, uh, Motown, anything that was on the radio. You had to play it because you that that you you were a top forty band. Where nowadays it's a tribute band business, right? A a band just dedicates their life or their musical, you know, aspirations to being the best copy of a famous band, as a <laughs> tribute band. So you're basically you're recreating somebody's creation, original creation, original. By and by that I mean is you do pre-production. You you know you write the song, do pre-production. You go in the studio and you create this album. And then we, as recording artists, we have to recreate that, recreate yeah. it for That's the rest tough. of our career. You know, well, it's tough, but also it gives you a lot of freedom because, to be yeah. honest with you, as somebody who's played on on many records, when you are in the process of making the record, you you it's a filter. It's a filter you have to go through. The person who wrote the song has an idea of what you should be playing. Then you have the producer, the engineer has an idea of what you should sound like. The uh, you know, there's the A and R guy might not like your bass line for whatever reason. So it's it's a filter. Once you hit the stage and you're looking at the audience, that's when you really find out what your place in the song is all about. Because there's yeah. nobody there. I mean, unless you're playing as a for a solo artist, that either the music director or the artist say, "I don't like the way you're interpreting what's on the record." But if you're really in a band, like say the Who, the Who never played what they recorded like they played it live. Right. It was well, always a completely different. different. Yeah. And, and to me, that's the freedom. Of that, once you have created that, then you interpret it live. Yeah, you can move from there. Do it com- you can move from there, and you can do it different I according like to according to the environment, inward and outward environment. Could be your own inward personal emotional environment that you happen to be in, hmm. or it could be the environment of like your own stage and sonically. How does the equipment sound? How's your mix? How's your monitors? How's the crowd? All of that. So you have all of these elements that make every performance a unique masterpiece. Mm. And man, it sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. And listen, I I definitely think people should go check you out on the road. Of course, Quiet Riot is going to be touring and we're going to have all those links for people to go and check you out. Yeah, you're touring. So we're going to have those links so people can get tickets. And Rudy, thank you so much for... I'm in Alberta, actually, and I just saw Quiet Riot is going to be coming. Oh, so I'm going to try to get are, out there. We are in uh, Edmonton Sunday, this Sunday. And then we, we just played Newfoundland uh, nice. about a month ago. Um, and then we're going to be in Toronto at the Rama Casino. Nice. Coming up in September. And yeah, yeah. Very cool, man. Yeah, I'll see if I can try to swing by on Sunday there. That would that'd be really cool to, to check oh, you guys Sunday, out. Yeah, let me know.